Hello, in this video, I'll be working through unit three review homework problems, and these all have to do with rules of differentiation. For number one, the graph of f of x and a table of values for g of x and g prime of x are given below. If h of x is the square root of f of x times g of x, what is the slope of the line tangent to the graph of h when x is equal to negative three? So in order to find the slope of the tangent line to h, we're going to have to find the derivative of h. So we want to start by finding h prime of x. Now h of x is the square root of f times g. So we're going to need to use the chain rule here since it's not just the square root of x. It's the square root of other stuff. So the derivative of square root of stuff is 1 over 2 times the square root of the stuff, so I'm gonna just keep that the same, f of x times g of x. And then the chain rule part, we have to multiply by the derivative of the stuff. So the derivative of f of x times g of x. Okay, so we've got one over two times the square root f of x times g of x times, and now to find the derivative of f of x times g of x, I'm going to use the product rule. So I'm treating f of x as my first factor and g of x as my second factor when I do the product rule. So the product rule says we need to find the derivative of the first factor, that's f prime of x, times the second, so times g of x, plus the first f of x, times the derivative of the second, so g prime of x. Okay, now that is the derivative of h of x, that's h prime of x. And we specifically want the slope of the line tangent to h of x when x is negative three. So now we're gonna substitute in negative three for x. So we've got one over two times the square root of f of negative three times g of negative three times f prime of negative three times g of negative three plus f of negative three times g prime of negative three. So one over two times the square root f of negative three, we're gonna read from the graph of f of x. At negative three, f is equal to two. So f of negative three is two. We're gonna multiply that by g of negative three, which we'll read from the table. g of negative three is four. And we're gonna multiply by f prime of negative three. That's the slope of the graph of f when x is negative three. So I'm looking for the slope of the graph at that point. And this is linear, so I'm gonna use rise over run. The slope is positive one half times g of negative three. g of negative three we get from the table, that's four plus f of negative three, f of negative three we read from the graph, that's two, times g prime of negative three, g prime of negative three is negative two. And now we just simplify our expression. So one half times four is two, two times negative two is negative four, so we have two minus four or negative two on the top. Negative two on the top, then we have two times the square root of eight on the bottom, so our twos cancel out, and I'm left with negative one over the square root of eight. And it's fine to leave our answer like that. If you did wanna simplify that more, we could say that's negative one over two root two. And if you really wanted to, you could rationalize your denominator, but there's really no need for us to do that. Number two, the function f is pictured below. At which values of x is f defined and continuous but not differentiable. So let's pick out the places where f is not differentiable. f is not differentiable wherever we have a corner, a cusp, a vertical tangent, or a discontinuity. Also not differentiable at our endpoints. Okay, so potential places that we're looking for. Well, let me, let's just point out all of our discon or points where it's not differentiable. So that would be at this end point here at this removable discontinuity here, at this corner point here, at this jump discontinuity here, 
or at this end point here. And let's read the question again. We want to find the values of x where f is defined. Okay, so let's check each of those points. At 1, f is defined. At 2, f is defined. At 3, f is defined. At 4, f is defined. At 6, f is defined. Okay, so it's defined all those places because we have closed circles at those points and continuous. So now let's rule out the places where it's not continuous. Okay, so it is continuous at the end point because it's defined at the end point. It is not continuous here because we have a removable discontinuity. So it's not continuous there. It is continuous at this corner point because our circle is filled in. It is not continuous here. We have a jump discontinuity, so not continuous at four. And it is continuous at our end point here. So again, at which values of x is f defined and continuous, but not differentiable. So that would be x equals one. It's defined, it's continuous, but it's not differentiable because it's an end point. At x equals three, it's defined, it's continuous, and it's not differentiable because there's a corner point. And then at x equals six, it's defined, it's continuous, but it's not differentiable because we're at an end point. So x equals one, x equals three, and x equals six. Number three, use the piecewise defined function below to answer the following questions. f of x is defined as ax squared plus bx plus two for x values less than or equal to two and ax plus b for x values greater than two. If a is negative three and b is four, will f of x be continuous at x equals two? Justify your answer. Well, let's think about the definition of continuity. In order for f of x to be continuous at x equals two, we need to have the following. First of all, we need to know that f of two is defined and we need to find what that is equal to. Then we have to find the limit of f of x as x approaches two and figure out what that is equal to. And then we have to check to see if f of two equals the limit of f of x as x approaches two. So let's start by finding f of two. So step one, we're gonna find f of two. f of two is the value of the function when x is exactly equal to two. So x is exactly equal to two in this piece here. Two is in the domain of the top piece. So I'm gonna be looking at this equation, ax squared plus bx plus two, and evaluating that when x is two. Now we're told that a is negative three, so I can substitute that in for a, of negative three times, and then my x is gonna equal two, so two squared plus b, and we're told b is four, times x, which is two, plus two. And then let's simplify that, we get negative three times four, so negative 12, plus eight plus two. Well, the eight plus two is 10, so we have negative 12, plus 10 gives us negative two. So f of two, if I come back over here, is equal to negative two. Now I need to make sure, if this is continuous, I need to make sure that the limit of f as x approaches two is also equal to negative two. So let's find the limit of f as x approaches two. Well, since two is right where the domain splits, we're gonna have to find the limit as we approach two from both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So let's start with our left-hand limit. The limit of f of x as x approaches two from the left-hand side, from the left-hand side, we're in that top piece. So that's just gonna be the limit of ax squared plus bx plus two as x approaches two from the left-hand side. But now remember my a value is negative three. So let me put that in for my a, and my b value is four, so I can put that in for my b. So negative three x squared plus four x plus two. And we're gonna evaluate this limit using substitution. Well, this is actually the, the same thing mathematically we did to find f of two. So I know, yes, this is going to equal negative two. 
it's negative 3 times 2 squared plus 4 times 2 plus 2. So we get negative 2. But that's just our left-hand limit. That's not our two-sided limit. So now we want to find the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the right-hand side. And when I'm approaching from the right-hand side, now I'm not in that top piece because on the right-hand side of 2, our numbers are actually larger than 2. So now we're in this bottom piece. So that's going to be the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of ax plus b. And the a is negative 3, and the b is 4. So we're going to evaluate this limit using substitution. I'm going to substitute 2 in for the x, and I get negative 6 plus 4, which is negative 2. The left-hand limit is negative 2, and the right-hand limit is negative 2. And that tells me that the two-sided limit is negative 2. So coming back over here, now I can see that, yes, in fact, f of 2 is equal to the limit of f as x approaches 2. And that means that f is continuous at x equals 2. So yes, f of x is continuous at x equals 2. Part B, if a is negative 3 and b is 4, will f of x be differentiable at x equals 2? So in the last question, we were asked if f of x was continuous at x equals 2. This is different. Now we're asked if f is differentiable. So the two things we need to check here, first of all, we need to know that f of x is continuous at x equals 2. And we know that it is because that's the work that we did in part A. And the second thing, we need to know that the limit of f prime of x, that's the derivative of f, we need to know that the limit of f prime of x as x approaches 2 exists. Okay, so number one, we've already checked. Yes, f of x is continuous at x equals 2. Now we need to find the limit of f prime of x as x approaches 2. So let's write a piecewise equation for f prime of x. The equation for f of x when x is less than or equal to 2 is ax squared plus bx plus 2. The derivative of that is 2 times a times x plus b. And since we know a is negative 3 and, and b is 4, I think it'll be easier to go ahead and put those values into our functions. So a is negative 3, that means that f of x now is equal to negative 3x squared plus 4x plus 2. And then for x values greater than 2, f of x is equal to negative 3x plus 4. And I'm going to take the derivative um, with those values filled in. So f prime of x for x less than or equal to 2 is going to be negative 6x plus 4. And the derivative of f for x values larger than 2 is just going to be negative 3. Now we want to find the limit of f prime of x as x approaches 2. But 2 is right where this domain splits. So we're going to have to find the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit separately. Let's take the limit of f prime of x as x approaches 2 from the left. Okay, there we're in the top piece of our piecewise function. We're approaching 2 from the left of negative 6x plus 4, and we're going to evaluate that limit using substitution. I substitute 2 in for my x, so I get negative 6 times 2 is negative 12 plus 4 is negative 8. The limit of f prime of x as x approaches 2 from the right hand side, now I'm in the bottom piece of our piecewise defined function. I'm approaching 2 from the right and we're just taking the limit of negative 3 as x approaches 2 from the right. So we'll find this limit using substitution but there is no x to substitute the 2 into, so this limit is just negative 3. Now notice the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are not the same, so that means our derivative does, the limit of our derivative does not exist as x approaches 
two. And since we have failed to satisfy the second condition, we can conclude that f of x is not differentiable. It's continuous, but it is not differentiable at x equals two. Part C, for what values of a and b will f of x be both continuous and differentiable at x equals two? So now we have to find the values of a and b that are gonna make this work, make it work so that our function is continuous and it's also differentiable. So we're gonna do this in two parts. First, we're gonna make sure that it's continuous. So in order for our function to be continuous, we know that f of two has to equal the limit of f of x as x approaches two. So f of two equals a times two squared, so a times four, plus b times two plus two. And if we simplify that, we get four a plus two b plus two. Four a plus 2b plus 2. That's f of 2. And that has to equal the limit as x approaches 2. But since 2 is right where the domain splits, in order to evaluate the limit, we have to find the limit from the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So the limit as we approach from the left-hand side, we're looking at the top piece here, the ax squared plus bx plus 2. And finding that limit by substitution, we get a times two squared plus b times two plus two, which is the same thing we got when we found f of two, two b plus two, okay. And then the limit, as we approach two from the right-hand side, now we're looking at the bottom piece, is a times x plus b, or two a plus b. So I know that these have to be equal to each other. These equations have to be equal to each other in order for the graph to be continuous. So I can say 4a plus 2b plus 2 has to equal 2a plus b. And I'm going to rewrite this in standard form here. So I'm going to subtract the 2a on both sides and that gives me 2a. I'm gonna subtract b on both sides, that gives me plus b. And then I'm gonna subtract two on both sides so I get equals negative two. And that's gonna be one equation that I have to satisfy in order for our function to be continuous and differentiable. This equation must be true in order for f to be continuous at x equals two. Okay, so moving on now, we're gonna see what has to be true in order for our function to be differentiable at x equals two. So in order for it to be differentiable, first of all, it has to be continuous. So, and in order for that ha to happen, two a plus b has to equal negative two. But then we also need the limit of f prime of x as x approaches two to exist. So again, since two is where our domain splits, we have to find the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit. And I need an equation for f prime of x. So I'm gonna come back up top here and let's write our equation for f prime of x, the derivative function. Well, the derivative of ax squared plus bx plus two is two ax plus b. And so we'll use that as our derivative equation for x values less than or equal to two. The derivative of ax plus b is just a. We'll use that as our derivative equation for x values greater than two. So to find our limit as we approach two from the left-hand side, I'm gonna use the top piece for my piecewise function. So that's gonna be, I'm gonna substitute two in for the x, I'm gonna get two times a times two plus b, or four 
a plus b. When I take the limit of f prime of x as I approach 2 from the right hand side, now I'm using the bottom piece. And the equation there is just a, so I put 2 in for x, but we don't have an x, so that limit is just a. In order for the two-sided limit to exist, the left-hand limit must equal the right-hand limit. So that tells me that 4a plus b must equal a. That has to be the case, otherwise this limit doesn't exist. And if the limit doesn't exist, then our function is not differentiable. So I'm going to rewrite this in standard form. I'm going to subtract a on both sides, and then I get 3a plus b equals 0. So this is the equation that must be satisfied in order for f of x to be differentiable, along with the equation that must be satisfied in order for f of x to be continuous. So both of these equations simultaneously have to be true. This is a system of equations that we need to solve. Okay, so I'm going to solve this one using elimination. So I line up my equations, 2a plus b equals negative 2, and my second equation, 3a plus b equals 0. And now I'm going to take the top equation minus the bottom equation. So instead of subtracting, I'm going to add the opposite. Or we can say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to multiply the top equation by negative 1. So the 2a becomes a negative 2a, the plus b becomes plus negative b, and on the right, the negative 2 becomes a positive 2. And now I'm just going to add the left-hand sides and then add the right-hand sides. So when I add the left-hand sides, I just get a. Negative b plus b is 0, so that just cancels out. And when I add the right-hand side, 2 plus 0 is 2. So now I know that a equals 2. That's part of my solution. And if a equals 2, I can substitute that value into a into either one of the original equations in my system. So I'm going to use this one that says 3a plus b equals 0, and I'm going to substitute 2 in for a. So that gives me 6 plus b equals 0, or b equals negative 6. So my final solution here, I have a equals 2, and then b equals negative 6. Those are the values that will make f of x both continuous and differentiable for x equals 2. Number four, find each of the indicated limits. Now these limits are in the form of our difference quotient, the limit definition of the derivative. So we had two versions of the limit definition of the derivative. The first one was the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h that limit is equal to f prime of x. Okay, then we have the alternate definition of the derivative, which says the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a equals f prime of a. Okay, so we're going to be referring to those two definitions in order to solve these problems. Part a, we want the limit as h approaches 0, so it already seems like it's in the form of this first difference quotient that I wrote. The limit as h approaches 0 of the natural log of x plus h minus the natural log of x over h. This is just going to equal f prime of x. If we can figure out what our function is for f of x, then the answer to this limit problem is just f prime of x, the derivative of our function. And f of x, I can read right from this problem, is just this function that comes after the minus sign. So f of x equals ln x. And then the limit here, this entire limit, that we're trying to solve is just equal to f prime of x. And if f of x equals ln x, then f prime of x equals 1 over x. So that is my answer to part a.
Part B, we want the limit as h approaches 0 of the cube root of 2 times x plus h minus 3 minus the cube root of 2x minus 3 over h. Again, this is in the exact form of this first definition I wrote up here at the top, the limit definition of the derivative. So we can see h is approaching 0, and what comes after the minus sign is our function f of x. Right here, after the minus sign, that's our function f of x. So in this problem, f of x equals the cube root of 2x minus 3. I'm going to write that as 2x minus 3 to the power 1 third just to make the derivative easier. So, the, so now that I know my f of x, I know that this entire limit, this entire limit is just equal to f prime of x. And f prime of x, I just use my power rule and chain rule to take the derivative of 2x minus 3 raised to the power 1 third. So I start with power rule. This is stuffed to the power 1 third. So the derivative is 1 third times stuff to the power 1 third minus 1. 1 third minus 1 is negative 2 thirds. And then times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of 2x minus 3 is 2. So my answer is going to be 2 thirds times 2x minus 3 to the negative 2 thirds. If we don't want to leave a negative exponent in our answer, then really in my numerator I just have a 2. In my denominator I have the 3 but then I also have the 2x minus 3 to the power positive 2 thirds. Okay, so that is equal to the limit for part b. Part c, limit as x approaches pi over 2 of sine x minus sine pi over 2 over x minus pi over 2. Now this one is in a different form. It's not the limit as h approaches 0. x is approaching pi over 2. So this is in the form of the alternate definition of the derivative, this second one that I wrote up top here, the alternate form. So now how do we find our f of x? Well we're looking for what's located right here in front of our minus sign. That's our f of x, our function f of x. So in this case that's the sine x. So my function f of x equals sine x and this whole thing is equal to f prime of a. My a value I can find either by looking right here or in the denominator I can find it by looking right here. So in this problem the a is pi over 2. So the answer to this limit problem is f prime of a or f prime of pi over 2. To find f prime of pi over 2 first I'm going to find f prime of x. If f of x equals sine x, then f prime of x equals cosine x. But our final answer is going to be f prime of pi over 2. So cosine of pi over 2, and the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So the answer to part c, this entire limit right here, is 0. Part D, limit as h approaches 0, tangent of 3 times x plus h minus tangent of 3x over h. So this is in that first form, and I can see right here my function f of x is tan 3x. And this entire limit is just going to be equal to f prime of x. So f prime of x is the derivative of tangent of 3x. And we need chain rule here. It's not just the tangent of x, it's the tangent of 3x, the tangent of stuff. So the derivative of tangent of stuff is secant squared stuff times the derivative of the stuff, and the derivative of the 3x is just 3. So 3 secant squared 3x, and that's going to equal this limit. Number 5, let f of 7 equal 0, f prime of 7 is 14, g of 7 is 1, and g prime of 7 is 1 over 7. Find h prime of 7 if h of x equals f of x over g of x. So let me rewrite that, h of x equals f of x over g of x, 
and I want to find h prime of x. We're going to use the quotient rule, so I take the derivative of the top, f prime of x, times the bottom, times g of x, minus the top, f of x, times the derivative of the bottom, g prime of x. All of that over the bottom squared, so g of x squared. And we specifically want to find h prime of 7. So h prime of 7 is f prime of 7, which is 14, times g of 7 is 1, minus f of 7, which is 0, times g prime of 7, which is 1 seventh, all over g of 7, which is 1 squared. So we have 14 minus 0 divided by 1, or just 14. Number six, h of x equals two times the square root of x plus four plus two. What is the value of h inverse prime of six? So step one, we're going to find where does h of x equal six. So we take our equation for h, two times the square root of x plus four plus two, and we set that equal to six and solve. So I'm gonna subtract two on both sides, I get four on the right, then I'm gonna divide both sides by 2, I'll have 2 on the right, so I have square root of x plus 4 equals 2. And now I can square both sides, I get x plus 4 equals 4, and x equals 0. So that tells me that h of 0 equals 6, but what we're really interested in is the fact that h inverse of 6 equals 0. So we're going to take that answer from step 1 and we're going to substitute it into the derivative of h. For step 2 we find the derivative, so h prime of x, and then we're going to substitute the answer from step 1 into that. So h prime of x, I'm going to have to use the chain rule here and my square root rule. I have 2 times the derivative of the square root of x plus 4. It's not just the square root of x, it's the square root of stuff. So the derivative of square root of stuff is 1 over 2 root stuff times the derivative of the stuff, but the derivative of x plus 4 is just 1, plus the derivative of 2, which is just 0. So I don't really need that, and I don't really need that. And then my 2's cancel out and h prime of x is just equal to 1 over the square root of x plus 4. So we're going to substitute our answer from step 1, the 0, into h prime. So h prime of 0 equals 1 over the square root of 0 plus 4, and that's just 1 half. Then for step 3, we take the reciprocal. The reciprocal of 1 half is 2, so that is my final answer. The derivative of h inverse at 6 is equal to 2. Number 7, find the derivative of y with respect to the appropriate variable. So let's recall our derivative rules for sine inverse and tan inverse. The derivative of sine inverse x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And the derivative of tan inverse x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, so we'll be using those rules to do these problems. Part A, find the derivative of sine inverse of 2t. So this is sine inverse of stuff. The derivative of sine inverse stuff, looking over here, is 1 over the square root of 1 minus stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. So y prime equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. The stuff is 2t, the derivative of 2t is 2, so I'm multiplying by 2. And if we want to simplify that, it's 2 over the square root of 1 minus 4t squared. Part B y equals arc sine of x over 2. 
So we want to find the derivative of sine inverse of x over 2. So our derivative is 1 over the square root of 1 minus the stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of x over 2, think of x over 2 as 1 half x. So the derivative of 1 half x is 1 half. And simplifying that, we have a 1 in the numerator. I can move my 2 to the front of my denominator. And then I have the square root of 1 minus x over 2 squared is x squared over 2 squared, or x squared over 4. This is a complex fraction now, so I don't want to leave a fraction inside of a fraction. So in order to simplify this, let me just expand my square root symbol here. I'm going to rewrite the number 1 as 4 over 4 so that I have a common denominator. Okay, So it'll be 1 over 2 times the square root of, I'm going to make this 1 a 4 over 4. So then I get 4 minus x squared over 4. And when you're taking the square root of a fraction, you can split it up into square root of numerator divided by square root of denominator. So then we have 1 over 2 times the square root of 4 minus x squared over the square root of 4. The square root of 4 is 2, and that's going to cancel with this 2. So my final answer here is just 1 over the square root of 4 minus x squared. Part C, y equals tan inverse of 5w. So this is tan inverse of stuff. The derivative of tan inverse of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. The derivative of tan inverse of stuff is 1 over 1 plus stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. So my y prime is 1 over 1 plus the stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of 5w is just 5. If we simplify this, we get 5 over 1 plus 25w squared. Part D, y equals x squared arctan 3x. So we need product rule to find this derivative. Our first factor is x squared. Our second factor is arctan of 3x. When we get to the part of the product rule where we have to take the derivative of arctan 3x, we're also going to need to use the chain rule because it's not the arctan of x, it's the arctan of other stuff. We're going to start with our product rule. So we take the derivative of the first factor. The derivative of x squared is 2x, and we multiply that by the second factor, arctan 3x, plus the first factor, x squared, times the derivative of the second factor. So here's where I have to find the derivative of arctan of 3x. The derivative of arctan stuff is 1 over 1 plus stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of 3x is 3. So that's going to be 2x arctan of 3x plus now when I multiply this out, I have a 3 in the numerator times the x squared, so I have 3x squared in the numerator. And in the denominator, I have 1 plus 9x squared. So all of that is my final answer. Number 8, find the derivative of y with respect to the appropriate variable. So part a, we're going to find dy dx. And if you want to use the notation y prime, that's okay too. But I'm going to go with the Leibniz notation. So dy dx equals, we're going to use the quotient rule. So we take the derivative of the top, we multiply that by the bottom, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, all over the bottom squared. So in the numerator, I have 2 times 2x, and then 2 times negative 1. And then, well, let's do that part first, I guess. So we've got 4x minus 2 minus, I'm going to, here I'm going to distribute the negative and the 2 at the same time. So I have to multiply the 2 by the 1 and the 2 by the 2x, and then I have to multiply 
all of that by negative one. So essentially I'm, I'm multiplying 2x plus 1 by negative 2. Okay, so I have the 2 times the 2x is 4x times the negative 1 is minus 4x. Then I have 2 times 1 times the negative 1, which is negative 2 over bottom squared. 4x minus 4x is 0. Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4. So my final answer, negative 4 over 2x minus 1 squared. Part B, y equals the cotangent of 2 over t. The derivative of cotan x is negative cosecant squared x. We're going to have to use chain rule here because it's not just the cosine of a single variable. It's some other stuff. And it's not an x, it's a t. So our derivative is not going to be dy dx. It's going to be dy dt. The derivative of cotan stuff is negative cosecant squared stuff. So negative cosecant squared stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So now I have to multiply by the derivative of 2 over t. We can think of 2 over t as 2 times 1 over t. We have to take that derivative. And the reason I'm writing it that way is because 1 over t is one of the functions I asked you to memorize. The derivative of 1 over t is negative 1 over t squared. So we have negative cosecant squared of 2 over t times 2 times negative 1 over t squared. So we have this negative times this negative. We'll just make it positive. And then this 2, I'm going to move in front as my coefficient. So 2 times cosecant squared of 2 over t. And then the t squared is in the denominator. So we'll keep that down there. Now notice this one. This is not a complex fraction because this fraction, the 2 over t here, is inside of the cosecant squared. So we're not going to try and simplify this. We're going to leave this one as is. Part c, y equals x times the square root of 2x plus 1. So I have to do product rule. My first factor is x. My second factor is square root of 2x plus 1. When I get to the part of the product rule where I have to take the derivative of the square root of 2x plus 1, then I'm going to use the chain rule. My variables are y and x, so this is going to be dy dx, and product rule starts out derivative of the first, so derivative of x is just 1, times the second, so square root 2x plus 1, plus the first times the derivative of the second. So now I have to take the derivative of the square root of 2x plus 1, square root of stuff. So if you've memorized your derivative rule for square root of x, then square root of stuff is easy. The derivative of square root of stuff is 1 over 2 root stuff times the derivative of the stuff. And in this case, multiplying by 2 and dividing by 2, those cancel out. So I get square root 2x plus 1 plus x over the square root of 2x plus 1. If we wanted to simplify that further, I could multiply the first term by square root of 2x plus 1 over square root of 2x plus 1, and that would allow me to combine some like terms in the numerator, but I'm going to leave it like this. And our final problem, number 8, to find the derivative of y with respect to the appropriate variable. Oh, this is a continuation. Okay, so we're still going with our derivatives. Our variables in part d is r and theta, so we're going to find dr d theta. Now this is a trig function raised to a power, and I always recommend you rewrite that. When you have a trig function raised to a power, rewrite it so that the power is on the outside. This is the tangent of 3 minus theta squared, all raised to the power 2. So my inside function, tan of 3 minus theta squared, that's inside of an outside function, which is stuff squared. But I have another inside function inside of my tangent function. So this is going to be a double chain rule problem. We have two inside functions. 
So let's start with our outermost function, the stuff squared, the derivative of stuff squared. So this derivative is going to be dr d theta. Derivative of stuff squared is 2 times the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. Okay, so now I need to take the derivative of tan of 3 minus theta squared. We need to find that derivative, and that derivative also requires chain rule. So I have 2 tan of 3 minus theta squared, all that to the power 1, times, so the derivative of tangent of stuff is secant squared stuff times the derivative of stuff. So we have tangent of stuff. The derivative is secant squared stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So now I want the derivative of 3 minus theta squared. We're taking the derivative with respect to theta. So we're going to use the power rule here. The derivative of 3 is 0. The derivative of negative theta squared is negative 2 theta. And all of this stuff is being multiplied. We can multiply in any order. So I have my 2 way out front and this negative 2 that's being multiplied at the end. So that's going to make it a negative 4 times theta times the tangent of, the of 3 minus theta squared times secant squared 3 minus theta squared. All right, part e, y equals the natural log of the square root of x. So our natural log rule, the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. Natural log of stuff would be 1 over stuff times the derivative of the stuff. Our variables here are y and x. This derivative is going to be dy dx. So I have natural log of stuff. The derivative of natural log of stuff is 1 over the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of square root of x is 1 over 2 root x. When I simplify this, I get 1 over 2x. Part f, y equals x times e to the negative x. So we have a product here. We're going to use product rule. Our variables are y and x, so this will be dy dx equals derivative of the first is 1 times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, the derivative of e to the negative x, this is e to the stuff, derivative of e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So we have e to the negative x, and then the negative one is going to make this minus x e to the negative x. If we wanted to, we could factor out e to the negative x and that would become 1 minus x. And then if we didn't want a negative exponent, we can move that down to our denominator. So we'd have 1 minus x over e to the x.